Hi everybody, it's Disney Queen Skelly here. Um, just a heads up, I am wearing jewelry. <laughs> I'm only wearing one earring because it hurts to put the earring on with this headphone in. But anyway, so um, as you know, one of my last videos was a versus where I did um, great moments with Mr. Lincoln versus the Hall of Presidents. Um, if you guys didn't watch that video, I recommend to go watch it now before you watch this one because this one's going to actually be a part two. I mentioned in the previous video that um, the article I got the Hall of Presidents from had two parts to it. It was a two-part article. So I'm going to be reading part two now. Um, if you guys already gave your opinion in the last video, um, you know, if you guys change it, or you have something else to say, you can obviously, you know, post your comment down below. Um, if you haven't given your opinion yet and you were waiting for part two, here is your chance. So I hope you enjoy part two on Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln versus the Hall of Presidents. After his passing in December 1966, Walt Disney left behind an entertainment empire to a group of bewildered staff members, artists, and imagineers. It was only through their passion and commitment to their late visionaries dreams that the unprecedented Walt Disney World project could go forward. Before them was the mammoth task of master planning more than 27,000 acres of land. What would emerge from the central Florida swamplands would be an improved Disneyland style park that would incorporate new and exciting experiences for guests. Incidentally, one of the most prominent new experiences required a good look back, back even a decade to plans of Walt's abandoned dream of the Hall of Presidents. But where to put it? While Magic Kingdom Park would incorporate most of Disneyland's themed lands, New Orleans Square wouldn't make the cut based on Florida's proxim proximity to the Big Easy. Instead, a totally new land, Liberty Square, would be unique to the park, and timely too, as America's Bicentennial was just around the corner. The old Liberty Square concept was resurrected and it served as host to what Walt and his staff considered as one of the most exciting projects they have ever undertaken. Luckily for the Imagineers, much of the pre-planning work for the Hall of Presidents had been completed in the early 60s. They had done extensive research, written several scripts, and created a detailed model theater. But even more daunting challenges were ahead for WED Enterprises to create realistic and life-size figures of each of the presidents. They had already completed an amazing likeness of Lincoln, but could they achieve the same realism with 35 other presidents? The hand of the sculptor and the skull of the artist. The skill of the artist. Over the 15-year development of the Hall of Presidents, WED Imagineers referenced hundreds of paintings thousands of photographs, 300 or so periodicals, and more than 600 backs bu books to give their prestigious vision the right atten attention detail, and all is just accounted for the preliminary research. By making several trips to Washington, D.C., Williamsburg, and other historical sites, writers, designers, and painters sought to authenticate their work by seeking in the most, by soaking in the most atmosphere of where our nation's presidents worked and lived. With the final plans for their presentation in mind, it was finally time for Imagineers to start the production process. For the attraction's film portion, more than a dozen WED artists worked under the supervision of three-time Academy Award winner John DeCure, painting some 85 masterpieces in the styles of the periods in which the depicted actions took place. Some of their paintings were more than 40 feet long. Disney legend Oob Earworks, who you'll remember as a longtime partner of Walt's and the original animator Mickey Mouse, was responsible for developing a new system to capture the specially made paintings onto 70 millimeter film. This would be Oob's last project for Disney before he passed away. As for the presidents themselves, Imagineers worked diligently to determine their proper height and weight. This information helped them to establish the president's body, positioning, and placement on stage. For instance, James Madison, so, not, so as not to be overshadowed by those around him, would sit because he was the smallest president at 5 foot 4 and 100 pounds. It was up to Imagineer and Disney legend Blaine Gibson who 
so accurately sculpted President Lincoln a few years earlier to produce the rest of the figures in exacting detail. Exhausting all resources possible, the sculptor learned as much as he could about the leaders as he sought to reflect in his craft the feeling of each president's personality. My goal in sculpting is to render the uniqueness of an individual, Blaine once explained. Improvement to the bust cease only when the instinctively when he instinctively felt he had done so. It was time for cosmetology to step in. While the busts were sent to Guatemala, where wig masters created authentic hair pieces, tailors meticulously cut, sewed, and stitched period fabrics in the style in the styles in vogue during each president's time in office, right down to the seams. The attention to detail did not stop there. Antique furniture was studied. George Washington's chair was an exact repro reproduction of the one our founding father sat in during the 1787 Constitutional Convention. And shoes, watches, and proper eyeglasses were specifically made. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was given a Phi Beta Kappa key to wear on his jacket, and President Andrew Jack Johnson, Hayes, and McKinley even sported lapel pins from the Civil War area. When the Hall of Presidents welcomed President George W. Bush in 2001, Imagineers du du duplicated his inscribed Timex Indiglo watch to a T. Although most of these details have gone unnoticed by guests, they have profoundly contributed to the pre presentation integrity. The Days of 71 On Walt Disney World opening day, 1971, after years of painstaking research and exacting execution by Disney Imagineers, the Hall of Presidents officially welcomed its first guests. Heralded as a vast and stirring tableau by, on cri by critics, the show became an instant classic. In many ways, it remained true to, the, true to concepts which originally excited Walt. Five massive screams, screens swept audiences into landmark his, historical periods, which most challenged and affirmed the importance of the Constitution and presidency, later to part and reveal each of, the, each of our nation's leaders on stage. The film's first major scene placed guests right into the middle of the Constitutional Convention of 1787, an experience which Walt himself conceived as interactive. If there's one thing I've learned about what people like, it's that they enjoy being more than just a spectator or bystander. They like to participate. The same held true during the Lincoln-Douglas debate scene. You'll return to that hot summer of 1858, Walt once pitched. You'll hear the hecklers in the crowd ra around you. The show remained true to even these tiny details. Imagineer Leota Toombs gives some finishing touches to President Thomas Jefferson before his big debut. Those of you Disney trivia buffs might have recognized several voices used in the film. There's Paul Fries, the Haunted Mansion ghost host, as George Washington, Governor Mifflin and Stephen A. Douglas, Dahl McKinnon, McKinnon the narrator of Disneyland's Mind Train through Nature's Wonderland, voiced Andrew Jackson. Several pieces of the show's dialogue had actually been recorded in the early 60s in preparation for One Nation Under God. The whole presentation was narrated by American actor Lawrence D Dobkin. At the film's conclusion, marked with the blast off of Saturn V rocket, the screens parted and a red curtain revealed in an almost chilling moment the silhouettes of our nation's 36 presidents. As their names echoed through the theater, spotlights caught each leader's nod of acknowledgement. After the roll call concluded, President Lincoln, again voiced by Royal Dano, stood and addressed the audience. The illusion of reality was overpowering. This final speech, just like in Great Moments of Mr. Lincoln, was followed with a ground chorus of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Adding to the roll call, with each new inauguration, Blaine Gibson was tasked to create a likeness of our nation's newest leader to incorporate into the show. Although he retired from WED in 1983, Blaine partnered with Walt Disney Imagineering time and time again to carry on the tradition.
Here are some bits of trivia about his work over the past few decades. Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon. By 1971, Blaine found the former to be the easiest president to sculpt while he was most unsatisfied with the Nixon bust. The values of the latter president's dark hair and eyes heavily contrasted with that of, the, of his light-colored skin. Jimmy Carter. Our master sculptor studied him so well during the presidential debates that he didn't make his usual sketches before sculpting. Blaine already had a strong mental image. He developed a particular interest in the strength of Carter's eyes. Strongest suit. According to Marty Sklar, when First Lady Ro Rosalind Carter came to see the Hall of Presidents, she remarked on her faux husband's wardrobe. Oh my goodness, who gave you that terrible suit? She donated a new one. Ronald Reagan. There's a certain tendency for him to erupt into a smile spontaneously, Blaine observed. Studying Reagan's inner sense of humor, he successfully captured the president's Irish twinkle. Bill Clinton. On election night, Blaine concluded that it would be easier to sculpt the president's president-elect as his light-colored hair and face had similar values. You need a monochromatic scheme because the values come together better, he explained. Adding a new dimension. Walt once said that the Hall of Presidents should be a story to be told and retold. It must be constantly put before the public. This was the exact spirit taken by Disney Imagineers in 1993 when they sought ways to update the 22-year-old program. But it was CEO Michael Eisner who came up with the most significant change. What people want to see are the presidents, he thought. Let's do something that features President Clinton. That will draw guests in. For the first time in the show's history, the current president would have a speaking role. After the White House staff reviewed this reviewed a speech written by Imagineers and lyricist Tim Rice. The president personally approved the idea. Also, nothing to the Imagineers, his shoe size 13D and seam. Though it was a large enough challenge to fit a September recording session in with the president, an even more daunting task faced audio animatronics programmers of Walt Disney Imagineering. We see our current presidents on television every day, so it's harder to make them believable explained Imagineering executive Patrick Brennan, who finds aligning the body movements with the voices to be the hardest part of animating a figure. In a similar light, Blaine once compared sculpting contemporary presidents to painting a family portrait. Ultimately, the audio animatronics Clinton approved amazingly lifelike. It even incorporated the president's closed fist thumb up gesture which the Imagineers first noticed while filming him. The addition of Clinton was only part of an entire refurbishment. The film was recut to give greater emphasis on the issue of slavery. Disney Studio veteran Peter Renaday, voice of Ca Country Bear Jamboree's M.C. Henry, delivered a new speech for Lincoln. Maya Angelou, who had par participated in President Clinton's inauguration, provided a new narration for the show until the deep voice of actor J.D. Hall took over in 2001, the year President George W. Bush joined the hall. The 43rd president also delivered a speech for the show, and his recording session was reported to have lasted only about six minutes, stars and stripes forever. With the addition of President Barack Obama, the Hall of Presidents underwent its most significant change since the idea was first born. The film portion, now narrated by actor Morgan Freeman, holds a fresh and intense focus on the relationship between our nation's presidents and the American people. New paintings, photographs, and video clips are displayed alongside brilliantly restored original artwork. For the Obama figure itself, Blaine passed on his sculpting tradition to Valerie Edwards. Royal Dano and Pete Renaday have provided Lincoln's voice over the years. In the newest version of the show, the late Dano reprises his role, reciting the Gettysburg Address. For the first time ever, George Washington has a speaking role in the show, which is followed by a chorus of America the Beautiful. Incidentally, er early memos in the archives reveal that there were original concepts by Walt and his staff that date back to the 1950s. And yet, even in the 21st century, these revis revisions are 
as fresh and dignified as ever. Walt Disney truly believed that there is much to be gained by studying history, that the future development of his nation depended on the public's true understanding and appreciation of its past. If anything, the Hall of Presidents stands as a first testament to Walt's forward thinking. You were in you were in awe of someone who had the vision that this man had, Blaine once said. He was so far ahead of his time than most of us. And still today, over half a century since the show's conception, it is only through the vast source resources and talent of the Walt Disney Company that such a classic presentation can be reimagined once again to remark as one of the most outstanding tributes to the American dream. And that was part two and the final part for Grimmel's Mr. Lincoln versus the Hall of Presidents. Um, I do apologize for my stuttering. Sometimes even though you write your own, in your own handwriting, it's hard to read your own handwriting. So I apologize for my stumbling, but I hope you guys still enjoyed nonetheless. Let me know what you guys think um, in the comment section down below if you haven't given your opinion yet or maybe it's changed. So thank you guys so much for watching. Bye little skeletons. Stay safe. Love you guys.